<laughs> Happy Resurrection Day to each and every one of you. It's so good to have you. And uh, if you are visiting with us for the first time or haven't been with us for quite a while, we are in the middle of a study of the Gospel of John. And we're going to continue that study. We plan that study around this weekend. And so uh, we would like you, if you would, to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 20. And we'll, we already looked a little bit this morning. If you missed our sunrise service, uh, you missed out on a wonderful time. Um, it was a little chilly. Uh, but once the sun came up, you started sweating in your jacket. You had to get out of them. But uh, it was good. And we, we, we looked at the first 10 verses. But we're still going to consider those first 10 verses here this morning. Because as that first Resurrection Sunday unfolded, there was a growing clarity. What had started off as confusion on that first Resurrection Sunday turned into clarity once they had encountered the resurrected Lord. But prior to that, there was confusion, even on Resurrection Sunday. We often think about Resurrection Sunday, as soon as the sun comes up, we're all excited. Yes, he's alive, he's risen, we remember it. But on that first Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, they weren't so sure. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had many events in my life which all of a sudden I get clarity that perhaps I wouldn't have had previously. There are experiences that once you encounter these experiences and walk through them, all of a sudden you're able to see things in a totally different light. I mean, some of them are from the silly to the very profound. I remember when we, my wife and I were missionaries in Dominica and I was helping a friend of mine out in the banana fields that he had. And, and he asked me as we worked all morning, he said, hey, would you like to have a banana? Well, I don't really like bananas that much, you know, but it said, sure. But see, I had never had a banana picked freshly off the tree. And it was amazing, that banana. I, I also experienced the, the same kind of thing when I was in Hawaii on a missions uh, uh, responsibility that I had. And then again in the Philippines, where I ran into freshly cut and served pineapple. Now, I love pineapple. I love it, especially the fresher it is, and it's so sweet. It's amazing. It creates sores all in my mouth. And every time I go to the Philippines, I get it. I can't stand it. I mean, I'm not going to eat it. I'm not going to eat it, but I do anyway because it tastes so good. But then my mouth breaks out in ulcers, and I'm miserable for about a week. But the first encounter with the freshly picked and cut pineapple, amazing. This past New Year's Eve, I've heard about Wagyu steak, and anybody who knows me knows that I love steaks. I went to this place, and they had Wagyu steaks on the menu. I had a religious experience at that moment, that first piece in there, it was like, as you would say, butter. And it was just like, oh man, was it good. I've never had steak like that before. I hope I get a chance to have it again. It's just amazing. <laughs> My first winter in New England, back in 2000, I think it started in July. Because that, in 2000, July was really, really cold. We had um, Danny and Sarah Leitner's wedding out here, what used to be the soccer field. And the night wind was blowing and everybody's wrapped up because it's freezing. I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. And then it started snowing later on in the year and it just kept on snowing and snowing. And in my driveway, I had to climb up on the piles to actually shovel them off so that I could see out so I didn't get creamed by a car. And I'm going like, God, you have brought me to the Mecca of winter. I love it. It was amazing. Also, this is what snow is like. You get one to two feet at a time, not one to two inches. This is amazing. I know I'm a little childish that way, but I still get excited. And it's been really disappointing the last few years. But I'll never forget that first winter because I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Probably one of the most amazing events in my life 
was the birth of my son, my first child. I mean, Melody and I had gone through that time together and I thought I knew what it was to be a parent. We'd read some books. I, I thought I knew. And then we go through this and there's Tim. There's no instruction manual. <laughs> what am I gonna do? But you looked into his eyes and you went like, God, this is amazing. And I thought nothing could top that until I held my first grandchild. Amazing. Little Laney changed my life in ways that I would never, ever admit. Publicly, really. <laughs> I remember thinking my father, who was this strong military guy, really everything done right. But he melted with my My kids knew a father or grandfather that was my father. And I wanted to say sometimes, who are you and what did you do with my dad? My goodness. But now I understand that first experience and that little sassy nine-year-old now, is she nine? She'll look at me and she'll tell me right up front, she's going to be spoiled and I'm the one who's going to do it. <laughs> I am powerless with that young lady. I remember I went with the youth group here one time to, on a ski night. Why anybody wants to ski at night, I don't know. I love my snow, but I like to not ski on it. And I went to the bunny hill because I didn't know how to snow ski. And then I realized that I've got a left knee that doesn't like to go left. So I'm, I'm going around in circles all the time. But then they said, okay, you're ready to go on top of the mountain. Ah, uh, no. I've looked at mountains where people are skiing, but when you get up on the top and you're looking down, uh, no, 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 no. Where is the you know, ski lift to get you down? I want the ski down, not the ski lift. I want to get down from this, but I've slowly made my way down on my bottom, all the way to the bottom. I'll never forget too, the first time I ever stood next to an NBA player, seven foot tall, it's one thing to say he's seven foot tall. It's another to stand next to him. One of the young men that I played with in Dominica, he actually was drafted by the Boston Celtics and played on their farm team. And I was playing against him. We were on, he was from Foncalé, Dominica, and I went, we went to Foncalé and, and uh, we were playing on their court and I didn't realize how stupid I was. He was seven foot one. But I drove to the basket and he creamed it out of bounds and said, get out of here, Marshmallow. <laughs> now, I know there's a lot in the news about this and all that other stuff. I'm telling you right now, when he called me Marshmallow and he blocked my shot and then he went and got drafted by the Boston Celtics, <laughs> I played against Gath Joseph before he was what he was. First experience, I mean, he was towering, it was amazing. All of these first experiences, but nothing compares to that morning over 2,000 years ago when the confusion of the morning, they've taken his body. This sounds like a rumor. It can't be true. All of those thoughts, all those moments changed when they saw Jesus. When we look at this passage of scripture in John chapter 20, I want you to see the, 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 the repetition of a word. Verse one, it says this. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw. Now that word is repeated again in verse five. Look at verse five. And stooping to look in, he saw. That word is again repeated in verse eight, where it says, then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw. Then the same thing is happens in verse 14, where it says, having said this, she turned around. This is Mary Magdalene after uh, 
having an encounter with, with the angels, having said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing. The same thing as uh, the word is used in verse 18 in this chapter. In verse 18, Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Then in verse 20, we have the encounter where Jesus appears to the disciples minus uh, Thomas. And it says, and then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then in verse 25, now Jesus encounters uh, Thomas. In verse 25, it reads this way. Thomas is, is, right before he meets him, Thomas is saying, I hear what you say, disciples, but until I see his hands and the mark of his nails, and place my finger in the mark on the, of the nails and place my hand in his, to his side, I will never believe unless I see. Then in verse 29, we hear this. As Thomas sees him, Thomas says and answers, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, have you believed because you have seen me? Each one of these occurrences throughout this chapter are pushing us towards a, 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 an important truth that once they saw Jesus, everything changed. But Jesus wanted to understand that there was something greater than seeing the physical evidence. And that's what we wanna see here this morning. So let's just pray and ask God to guide us in this truth as we go through this passage really, really quickly. Our Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for the privilege that we have to look at it, to look back and see how those disciples move from confusion to clarity and how that you have given us these things in order that we might have clarity and might live our lives in light of the truth of what had happened over 2,000 years, having not seen it with our own eyes but through the eyes of others. We pray you bless our time in your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning in our early morning service at sunrise, we talked about there were three confusions that were taking place during that early morning hours that became clear as the day went on. And the first one was the negativity. And that we see in the, in the, the, the woman Mary, Mary comes to the tomb, and as soon as she sees the empty tomb and the stone rolled away, her immediate thought goes negative. They have taken the body. We don't know where he is. They have taken the body. That's the negative. There we also see the doubt where Peter and John rush to the tomb, and they say, what in the world? Where is he? And the text, as we look in Luke and as also in Mark, we see that they believed whatever was said, they believed, Peter in particular, believed that there's no way this could be happening. Matter of fact, we're told in Mark and in Luke and also here in John that they didn't believe. As we just read, they'll never believe. Thomas says, I'll never believe unless I see him myself. There's that doubt. There was one disciple, however, namely John, the other disciple that's talked about in this passage, who saw and believed, but as we see in verse eight of that chapter, he says, it says, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went on, he saw and he believed, for as yet they did not understand. So there's shaky belief. So you've got the negative response, you've got doubt, and you got shaky belief. He's not here, but I'm not sure what's going on. But each one of those responses, as, as inadequate as they were on that first Resurrection Sunday, were turned, and there was a radical refocus and redirection that took place in history because they saw him. You see, the negativity became assurance because Mary, when she first saw the empty tomb, she said, they stole him. But when she encountered Jesus, in verse 16, she cries out, Rabboni, which means teacher, which is a term of endearment and respect. And then she runs to the disciples in verse 18 and she says, I have seen the Lord. What happened? 
How did she get redirected and refocused? Because she saw him. She saw him with her eyes. And she experienced a radical redirection and refocus from negative to celebration to assurance. I have seen him. The doubt that we saw and we talked about with Peter and the disciples, the doubt was very clear. The disciples minus Thomas, they see the empty tomb or hear about the empty tomb. And Mark 16 says they would not believe. Luke 24 says this seems like a rumor or a fairy tale. What kind of nonsense are you telling us? Got Thomas saying, hey, unless I see his hands or I will never believe. Doubt. They knew all the things that Jesus had told them. They knew that Jesus was the miracle worker, but everything was shattered that Friday. And now they don't know what to do with the information that they're getting on Sunday. But then there was this encounter with the disciples minus Thomas. And when he showed them, the disciples were glad and they saw the Lord. And they went to Thomas and said, we have seen the Lord. That's when Thomas says, there's no way I'm not going to believe. No way am I going to believe that. But then Thomas encountered him. And Thomas cried out in John chapter 20, verse 28, my Lord and my God. You see, he was redirected and refocused because he saw him. It radically changed the disciples and everything that they had known changed in a split second because they had encountered Jesus. So shaky belief is the next one. Doubt becomes confidence. Shaky belief becomes solid belief because John now understands. He saw the empty tomb and at least he believed, but he didn't know what to do with it. He didn't understand. But just like the other disciples, we have seen the Lord. Radical change and redirection and refocus. So what shattered them on Friday still was troubling them on Sunday morning but eventually, as they saw him, everything changed. Because they knew everything that they had been told was true. Now, this morning, we've got to, and we've had the privilege to witness the same kind of radical redirection and refocus for these six people who were baptized. They testified of what God had done in their lives. Some of them were young when they came to know him. They amen to that. Through our children's program here, some wandered a totally different path, but nonetheless, Jesus, they encountered him and there was a radical change and refocus and redirection. Jesus alludes to that in this passage. That's what I want you to see here this morning. Here he says this, after Thomas proclaims, my Lord and my God, Jesus makes this statement. Jesus says to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And then John follows it up with the purpose of the whole gospel of John that he's written. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. We see when he, Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen but believe, he's talking about we who live here today, who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ today. Those who have stepped forward and given testimony of how Christ has come and they have encountered Christ and he's changed their lives forever and now they want to live for him for all of eternity. We've seen it. They haven't seen Christ like they did back then, but Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen, but believe. That's, that's a prophetic blessing by our Lord and Savior 
on those who have not seen but believe. You see, John's whole purpose in writing all the things that he did was so that we might believe and that in believing we might have life through his name. And that is why we gather on this day of all days to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. He came. He came and became a man in order that he might represent us and he might bear our sin and our shame and our guilt and our brokenness. And he bore that and he went to the cross and he paid the penalty for our sin and all of our brokenness. And when he went to the grave, the world and the rest of the angelic forces that had fallen with uh, Satan and all of his angels, they rejoiced. They thought they had won. But Jesus had already declared it on the cross. It is finished. And when he rose from the grave and an empty tomb was found, then we knew. They knew because they saw. We know because we have seen through their eyes that Jesus is alive. He is risen and he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. And there is coming a day when we shall see him as he is. That's the day we look forward to. And so the question this morning that I want to leave you with is this. And it follows on this statement, first and foremost. The beauty of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that we have been guaranteed eternal life that is not measured by our performance, but on his provision. And so my my question to you today, what are you putting your faith and trust in? It's wonderful that you're here. It's where we should be, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, most amazing event in all of history. But what are you putting your faith and trust in? Are you putting in your performance? Well, scripture's pretty clear. That's not a good idea. If you're thinking you could be good enough, or perhaps as one testimony said, we were CE Christians Christmas and Easter, And we came every Christmas and every Easter, but it didn't make much sense. It was just what we did. What what are you really putting your faith and trust in? Are you putting it in whatever traditions you might have or, or that your parents have passed on to you? I'm here to tell you, until you encounter Jesus personally, there is no salvation in all those things. Those are just parts of the puzzle. But it's when we come to know Jesus as our personal savior, when we recognize that we're sinners in need of a savior, when we have to repent of our sin and and say, Jesus, save me, because he's the only one who can. We started our service with the song, let me tell you about my Jesus. And I wanna say to you as I close, let me tell you about Jesus. He came. He died, he rose again, and he has provided salvation for all who believe without any cost to you or to me, just simply full and free. Jesus died for all of us. It matters not what your past is. What it matters is, is what are you gonna do now? Blessed are those who believe, who have not seen. Jesus paid it all. Jesus provided salvation full and free. And if you don't understand this this morning, don't leave here without talking to one of us. Don't do that. There's so much opportunity for you to experience and encounter Jesus in order to be saved. Don't leave here without it. Come to know him. Because to know him, believing in him, brings eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that we have. As we celebrate on this day, what you accomplished so many years ago, It's such a wonderful thing to be able to enjoy 
singing the songs of victory and praise, reflecting on what you did to save us. None of us in here deserve salvation. None of us could earn it. We were hopelessly and helplessly lost. But today we sing praises to your name because you have set us free. You have given eternal life to all who will believe. And so I pray for those that might be here today. They don't quite understand what we're talking about. I pray that today would be the day when they would believe. May your spirit move in the hearts of those who need the salvation that you offer. And we give you praise for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.